Hi everyone, my name is Fraser Kane, and I'm the publisher of Universe Today and it is your virtual star party for Sunday, uh, April 28th, 2013 and we've got a sort of a quiet uh, quiet group tonight. Uh, two telescopes, which we will be uh, sharing with you tonight. But we're going to get the, these two guys moving fast so there will be all kinds of things to look at. So joining us tonight we've got Gary Ganell. Hey Gary. Hi guys. And uh, you're in the Los Angeles area, and you've got nice clear skies. It's good. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then we got Roy Salisbury, who's in uh, Vegas, operating his uh, secret telescope from uh, from Arizona remotely. And uh, and we've been looking at some of the some of the views so far tonight, and it's great. So I think this is going to be good. Uh, no stupid moon tonight, right? Yet. Not For yet. another half an hour or so, and then it'll be up. So this is going to be good. Uh, and then for a color commentary, we've got uh, Stuart Foreman, who uh, has not got a telescope tonight, but he thought he'd join us and show a couple of pictures and talk a bit about processing uh, astrophotos, which I think is going to be great. Hi, everybody. And we got Scott Lewis. Hi, everyone. And we got Dr. Thad Zabo. Hey, Thad. Good evening. And uh, I know you're going to share a beautiful photo of Saturn that you took. Shortly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not so good. That's so, not such a beautiful photo. I'm sure people think it's great. Um, uh, BTL 743. No, I don't watch hockey, and I, I even though I'm a Canadian, I which is a I'm shame. Sorry. Hockey's I, awesome. I I don't know how I missed it. I, I think I just it wasn't big in my family. We watched the Stanley Cup, and and anyway, like I'm the only Canadian that I know who isn't a huge fan. I of think hockey, you are so. the only. Canadian. I am the only. <laughs> am I? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, the tragically, um, okay. he doesn't have a lyric about that. But oh, really? Um, so. so if uh, if you want to sort of ask us questions, uh, get more information, or give us some requests, we're glad to take them. You can uh, post them on the event page if you're watching it there. Uh, if you're watching this somewhere in the Google Plus stream, you can post a question there, and we'll try to get it. Although I'm not sure we can catch every single instance of that. So. Just be aware. Uh, if you're watching this somewhere embedded somewhere and you like to use the Twitters, uh, you can use the hashtag Star Party, or uh, we will use um, YouTube. And so YouTube. that, yes. yeah, and, you, and YouTube is pretty safe. So if you're watching this and you feel like your people aren't, you know, catching your comments, then we'll post them over, post them over on YouTube, and that you can be pretty safe that we'll see that. Yep. I'm seeing lots of YouTube posts right now. So, um. Uh, yeah, and so so just uh, again, I also apologize for the uh, orbital, the inclination of the Earth's axial tilt, uh, because we're moving into summer now. It's getting later and later for for the start times for the virtual star party. So uh, we're having to start at eight thirty Pacific Standard Time now, and probably by the end of this, by like the the height of summer, you know, June 21st, it's going to be uh, all the way to about 10 o'clock yeah. Pacific Standard Time. So, Sorry, East Coast. Yeah, sorry, East Coast. It's going to be <laughs> 1 in the morning for you. But then in the, in the you know, in the darkest of winter at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, that's 8 o'clock. It's perfect for the East Coasters. So, right. I, you know what, for all the East Coasties who grumble about this, there's like Australians that just love that this is showing up in their lunch hour and stuff. So it's, it works. <laughs> You're welcome, Australia. <laughs> You're welcome, this is Australia. Just for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so cool. So let's get let's get rolling tonight, and it's going to be a whole lot of galaxies. And so first, just as a cool first image, I've got to Roy Salisbury's view here of a bunch of galaxies, and I'm counting four, five, six in this image. Yeah, I I got about four, four or five. Yeah. So what 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 is this object? This is the main object is uh, M106. And it's got a really strange central core. Yeah, it's like, a, like if you look at it, it's like an S. I see like some kind of ninja throwing star. Actually, it's, or it's like yeah, a... Yeah, well, there you go. Or it's like a bat... It's space ninjas. The yeah. batarang or something when you look at that <laughs> sort of halo around. Is there, is there anything like unusual happening with M106? Thad, you might know something more about M106. There is some sort of gravitational disturbance, and if, if you look at the, the way the matter is distributed in it, it's, it's almost kind of tilted um, relative to where the spiral arms are. So they're kind of bent a 
a little bit. Um, I remember there were some articles about it a couple of months ago. Uh, I can't remember all the, the details right now, but yeah, there is some, some strange offset from um, the plane of the galaxy and, and the matter. So I'm not the, you know, the, the bulk of the, the matter. So there's, there is some type of gra gravitational disturbance that's warping the positions of the arms. So, and then over on the right hand side of this image, there's another galaxy just seen just right edge on. Yep. So again, any this time of year is terrific for galaxies. If you want to go galaxy hunting, if you, you have the plane of the Milky Way, and the part of the sky that's overhead right now is is looking out of the plane of the Milky Way, so towards the constellation Coma Berenices, Leo, Virgo, Ursa Major, that's all looking in when you're looking in that direction. You're looking out of the plane of the Milky Way. So. And then there's like these even little smaller ones. So you see there's like a little small one just to the right of M106. And then it looks like two even smaller ones. I'm not sure if this is coming through on the on the broadcast. Yeah, you, got, you got one here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see the little crosshairs. You got one right over here, right underneath there. Yeah. There's one tiny one down here. Yeah. There's another tiny one down here. They're scattered pretty well all over this image. So yeah. we should just challenge that's, you from that's now a on. How many, image. how many galaxies can you get into one image in the virtual star party? To have you do that. <laughs> I think you've you've oh. broken the record. Oh, oh. I, I got to try that now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you're gonna have to. S slew over to Markarian. Nice galaxy rich area. Slew over to Markarian's chain. You'll break it even in this star party. Or, really? Or, or, where, where is that? What, yeah, what is um, that? M84, M86, and then just a bunch of other galaxies. It's part of the Virgo cluster. It's not the center of the Virgo cluster. That's M87. There's plenty of galaxies around M87. But, um, yeah, the field of view around M86 and M84, uh, plenty of nearby, nearby, meaning about 55 million light years, uh, galaxies. So they show up pretty well. That's actually, right. if, you, if you go to the Griffith Observatory here in Los Angeles, that bottom wall, the big picture, the the yeah. far left side of the wall is um, the Virgo cluster. So you know, if if you want to blow it up to super size and post it on a wall somewhere, that's what the Griffith Observatory did. So yeah, remember well, seeing that? I'll try to do M eighty four later. Okay. Oh yes, yeah. When I was down in L A, Scott and Scott and I went to the Griffith Observatory. It was awesome. Uh, and I love the new basement down there. The huge yeah, wall. Yeah, oh. yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, if you're in LA, you gotta to go to the, that observatory. And and something that was great was the uh, we were watching the the show, the planetarium show, and the and the narration was done live. So the guy was doing the narration from scratch. Just he walked out with this globe in his hand, this glowing ball in his hand, and then he he did his narration. And then he went to the back of the room. He didn't kind of realize, but he was just there talking the whole time. Yeah. Didn't make a single mistake. I, I noted to Scott that you know somebody somebody's going to be an actor. Somebody is <laughs> also you know doing voice work. So yeah, it's phenomenal. Uh, the, all yeah. the different ones they have there, and they're all done live. They're they're never recordings. Roy, yeah. I put the in the chat comments. I put the uh, coordinates of Mercurian's chain. So if you go to the chat, you can pull it up and then slew okay. over to it. Yeah, awesome. I'll give it a shot. Okay, great. Yeah, it's going to be a very galaxy night tonight. Uh, now, Gary. Uh, there's something wrong with your image here. What's going uh, on? There is. There is. I thought I'd take a quick picture of M104. And then uh, since I wouldn't get a lot of detail, I thought I would invert it. And uh, I think Thad could probably tell us why this is historically significant. Uh, the, um, the inversion? The inversion. Or, well, if you, if you look at, for instance, the Palomar Sky Survey, so um, again, you can see plates from this if you go to Griffith Observatory. Um, but this is this is classically how we looked for deep sky objects from, say, the the Palomar Sky Survey. Is that they were presented in the negative, rather than dark um, dark image with with light objects on it. That takes a lot of chemicals to print, you know, a huge dark area and then light um, in the background. So this is it's actually kind of a, a chemical saving technique for developing this. Um, when you, you're trying to image huge regions of the sky, like with the, the Schmidt 48 inch camera on, on Palomar, um, which was largely used for surveys before this. And so if you're looking at, for instance, how Georgia Bell found galaxy clusters for his, uh, his dissertation work at um, Caltech, 
in the 1950s, it was scanning plates that look very much like Gary's photo here for um, clusters of galaxies. I, I did not know that that's why they did them as negatives, was, was sort of to save chemicals. I'm guessing, but I mean, yeah. I know what happens if I, you know, if I go to a public place and try printing out one of my astro photos, they're not too happy with it. <laughs> it's like the toner just disappears. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. this black background. Oh, there's a little bit of color something in there somewhere. Yeah, that's, that, you know, not, that public, public places don't appreciate that very much. So. <laughs> Um, and then, Stuart, what are you sharing here? Now, this isn't live because you're in the <laughs> comfort and safety of your own kitchen, but right. uh, this well, is a picture you took? Yeah, so we're on the subject of galaxies. So I actually got this idea from Roy. This is NGC 891, and this is a 60-minute um, exposure of, uh, uh, I believe, I think it was 60 minutes, 12 uh, 12 exposures of five minutes each that's um, stacked and processed wow. in, uh, in Photoshop. And um, on the high resolution image of this, you blow it up, um, I've counted up to 37 galaxies in this frame. Wow. Um, and so um, it's, this is a very galaxy rich, um, rich area. And I just like it because it has a nice edge on, uh, yeah. edge on galaxy there. And there's like right, a Roy, nebula Stuart just, just to threw the... down the hammer. You're going to have to show yeah. up. Yeah, <laughs> 37. you got to be 37, Roy. 37 well, galaxies is, in one this photograph. This is an hour-long picture, remember. So it's... Take an hour. Like, start right. gathering <laughs> light now, Roy, and then come back. And, and there's the whole star party in just whole one star. image. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I don't need 60 seconds. I just need one image. Yeah. Let's do this. Yeah. All right, well, continuing our galaxies, uh, what's your next one, Roy? This is M101. That is the whirlpool, or not the whirlpool, but a the, uh, the pin pinwheel. Pinwheel. This is the yes. pinwheel galaxy. So some spirally thing galaxy. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> but yeah, this one's fairly nearby. It's about 18 million light years off. There was a very prominent supernova in it late last year. Um, that being the brightest supernova since I guess. Um, 1987A, which was in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Now that's essentially right next door. This is nearby, kind of you know, same neighborhood, couple blocks over. Um, but when the, the supernova went off on it, it reached I think magnitude nine, maybe if I remember correctly. So not naked eye, but um, binocular object. And so again, that's the closest um, visible supernova to us since the one in the Large Magellanic Cloud back in um, in 1987. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sterling uh, Gothrop asks, how many galaxies have a supermassive black hole? Most. Yeah, most. Most. most Maybe galaxies all? galaxies do. Um, there is evidence, and we were talking about this a little bit last week with, um, I forget which galaxy we were looking at, that there isn't a strong evidence for a, a supermassive black hole in the middle, that the bulge is just not um, kind of indicative of... Um, of a supermassive black hole being there, but for the most part, any anywhere we're, we've uh, looked, tried to see if there's material that's being redshifted on one side, blue shifted on the other. Um, you know, there's there's usually been some some evidence of a, a supermassive black hole. It's much easier if stuff is falling in the super blast super super blastive black hole. No, super um, blastive black hole. Uh, is that the, the app store? Is this where you lose all your money? Exactly. Um, you know, if stuff is falling in, you get an active galaxy. So if material is being consumed at a high rate uh, by the supermassive black hole, then the, the center of it can glow extremely brightly in radio waves with visible light, with x-rays. And the closest one of those is NGC 5128 in Centaurus, Centaurus A. I know Nicole loves showing her radio picture of this galaxy because, um, I mean, it's just it's huge tracks of land, no, sorry, huge <laughs> lobes of radio lobes on either side of the, uh, the galaxy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's still, it looks messed up if you just look at it with visible light. It's like, well, it looks like an elliptical, but there's this big, broad band of dust across it. What the heck's going on? Yeah, the supermassive black hole in the middle is feeding at a pretty high rate. So, um, yeah. So M101, not an active galaxy, but there uh, is... Pretty likely a supermassive black hole in there. The, in most most galaxies, you do find one. Uh, 
Usually it's only a tiny, tiny percentage of the mass of the galaxy, though. Something like one um, one hundredth, one one thousandth of one percent. Although there is one out there that they found. It's NGC 1477. The supermassive black hole is 14% of the mass of the galaxy. Wow. So, wow. yeah, just... But I thought there bizarre. was this correlation just between the, the mass of the galaxy, the mass of the of the black hole, and the, and the question is, do the, you know, do the black holes come first and then the galaxies form around them, or does the well, there's galaxy There's a correlation form... between the bulge, the, the, the yeah. mass of the bulge and the, the mass of the black hole itself. Also, the for spirals, the tightness of the winding of the arms right. and the size of the black hole, the more massive the, the black hole at the center is. For instance, if you look at the one for the Andromeda galaxy, Andromeda, it's very hard to see spiral arms are in. It's, they're wound very tightly. The supermassive black hole over there is about 100 million times the mass of the sun. I think it's like 80 million times the mass of the sun. Um, so that's much larger than, say, for our galaxy, where the supermassive black hole is only 4 million times the mass of the sun, and the spiral arms in the Milky Way are not wound nearly as tightly. Right. So. Um, Chris uh, Sobinski, Sobinski asks, uh, do we join or just watch? Sobchinsky. So, Sobchinsky, yeah. Uh, so if you yep. have a telescope and you're able to stream a live view of the night sky, then we would love to have you join us. So yes. uh, we're always looking for more astronomers who be lo- who be able to help us out. And so if and you've William got that Bean, capability... If you're watching, I did get your email. I'm just behind at getting back to your emails. So yeah, I yeah. will we'll no. work with you and get you into the star party. Yeah, we would love, you know, as you see tonight, we've, we've got just got two astronomers. So we've right. got room for probably another six in any show. So we'd love to have more help. So... Uh, yeah, anyone who wants to join us, we're always glad to have you. Um, if you don't have a telescope, then yeah, you just watch. <laughs> um, all right, well, I'm going to move on to Gary's view here. And uh, Gary, what is this? This I is IC 443. I did, was able to find a nebula lurking out there. And I'm just trying to look up another name for it at the moment. Where is yeah, this? I, I, got is I, I don't IC think we've seen this before. Hmm. I can look through my Google, notes. Google, Google. It's the Jellyfish Nebula. Yeah. That's my one of the more common. I mean, I, I've, I think I see 434 holds the horse head. But, yeah, this this is another pretty common IC one. So I can't remember exactly what IC stands for. All right, if you're seeing, um, you know, there's a lot of these little prefixes, acronym things. I'm, I'm not sure of. M, of course, is Messier. NGC, yeah. New General Catalog. You also have like the Caldwell Catalog. Um, Sharpless. Sharpless. Um, you have Barnard's Catalog of Dark Nebulae. I'm not sure. Yeah, I should, I should know, look up what IC means. I think it's Index Catalog. Index Catalog. Well, that's special. I mean, right? just, Isn't you know, that, it's you like, we now have much more insight on what this is for. It's just the index, index catalog. catalog. That's kind of redundant, isn't it? Right. So, but it's the ATM machine. Here. The ATM I'm going to I'm going to get in here. I'm going to bring up another image of uh of sort of a long duration, long exposure view of this. Does make a difference, doesn't Ooh. it? But it's good just to be able to match it up. I mean, you know, your view is live, Gary. You're you're right there. You're you're well, doing it live. I wonder what uh, what sort of composite was done there? Which wavelengths were used for that image as well? Because Gary's just looking at H alpha. Yeah, yeah. So, this image was uh, from the Gemini, it? I think. No, this is mm. from the the Hawaiian Starlight C FHD. So that's the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. Yeah, so right. that's the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. Okay. So that's a There's... great big monster observatory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gary, how big is this uh, nebula in terms of its field of view? Um, well, my field of view is about uh, one degree high by one and a half wide. Uh-huh. Um, oh, I'm just looking it up here. It's 50 arc minutes. Okay, so it's pretty big. It's yeah. a good size thing. Sizable chunk of sky. Where Where is this one exactly? Or even roughly? Gemini. Gemini, okay. And it's a supernova remnant. Right. Correct. Around five thousand light years from Earth. 
Okay. And one interesting thing, I, I forget who I'd seen had posted about it, but the asteroid Vesta will be moving um, in front of the cluster M35 throughout mm -hmm. this week. So if you're out there and you, you have the capability of um, getting some shots of this, chances are you're not going to be able to look and say, oh, that dot is Vesta. That right. probably won't happen. But if you can take a photograph it on subsequent nights, you can do some blink um, com uh, comparisons. Or like we did with, um, let's see, was it Mike Phillips who found Pluto last summer? Where we did some some kind yeah, of comparisons so. between photos. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, Mike yeah. Phillips was able to to image. Pluto. So if you want the tiny little dot in the right, if you want to do this with an easy an easier object, um, Vesta would be available for that right in front of uh, M thirty five in the southern part of Gemini this week. And just to be absolutely correct, uh, according to uh, my program, this is in the revised IC catalog, not the plain one, the revised uh, one. Oh. Hmm. Um, uh, Chris asks again, are those colors accurate? I understand that with the older telescopes only give black and white photos and scientists fill in the colors. Is this true? So... It depends well, what you mean by accurate. Right, that's a really important <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, that's a whole show, isn't it? <laughs> the, the, yeah. the answer to the question is, is sorta, <laughs> <Right. laughs> kind of maybe, <laughs> kind of maybe. They're they're very the when you when you take these pictures, they're very very um, stuck to the left side of the histogram because it's very very dark, and so to get the colors, you have to um, really stretch it out. So you you take the image, you take the histogram, you really stretch it out, and you saturate it. So. Um, they're not exactly the right colors, but they sort of represent the the, the correct colors. Is kind of the best way to, right. to describe it. I mean, there's yeah. the, also the question of how do we even see color? Like, for instance, yellow is not a color the eye sees. It's something that the brain puts together from red and green. So, you know, the as opposed to what was it the the one the one type of shrimp that everybody was freaking out over the other week when they realized it could see 16 oh, the mantis shrimp? separate, the mantis shrimp, yeah. yeah. Um, that in, instead of like the cones in our eyes are capable of detecting three separate wavelength bands, essentially red, green, blue, this thing can detect 16 separate wavelength bands. So if you want to go ask something about color, go find a mantis shrimp because uh, hey, it's going to give you the best answers. Yeah. So. But, but also, I mean, thoughts, like, all right, uh, give me the scoop. It, in some cases, right, we've got, uh, like, some people are using DSLR cameras, and so they're, they're getting fairly accurate true color through the telescope. In other cases, uh, like what Gary has, this is, it's black and white. His CCD is more, uh, more sensitive, but just to one, you know, but it's, but it's always just giving you the one color, light and dark. And then, you know, he can take an image with three different filters to build up a, a full color image. Right. And it gets into what color really is and what we're talking about are going to be wavelengths of light. Yeah. And so very specific ranges for that. And so we could all observe light slightly differently because our brains and eyes mm -hmm. are slightly different. So when we're talking about yeah. the scientific sense, when we talk about colors, we're talking about bands of light and what's going on there at the wavelength and frequency. Yeah, even the, uh, the, the images that we're showing here that are black and white, Gary's are hydrogen alpha. But mine's luminous, which means it's basically just blocking the infrared light. And and also, I mean, even like, you know, all the images you see from the Hubble Space Telescope, from these big observatories, they're all false color, essentially. Uh, there's a few examples every now and then, for example, like this, like with the Cassini spacecraft and the Mars rovers, they will, uh, you know, they'll try and create what is roughly realistic color. And actually, the Curiosity rover has got a a full color camera built onto it. So a lot of the images that we see coming back from Curiosity are true color and they're what you really would see with your own eyes if you're standing on the They have their the calibration box. plates too to help. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Love the similar one there. But, but it's just, you know, it's it's just, it's not using one color. It's not using black and white CCDs. It's actually got full color CCDs on the on Curiosity. So it's, so it's pretty realistic. All right, well, I'm going to move on um, to what uh, what Roy's got. That is M104. Your version of M104, not reversed. Right. Correct. So, since we're not using ink, you know, or, <laughs> uh, or chemicals here, just just painting photons on your screen. Here we are with the uh, the 
That's yeah, the sombrero, right? Yeah, this is the Sombrero Galaxy. So, yeah. again, nice dark dust lane across the middle. Now, this, I think maybe this might be more appropriate for next week, the May 5th, the Cinco de Mayo Star Party. Oh, so, ole! Oh, right. But, we're, um, we're not doing tequila shots, guys. <laughs> that comes after. Right. But, but yeah. you know, this, again, kind of questions about classification for this galaxy because typically a broad dust lane like that you only see in a spiral. If you take infrared pictures of this um, the dust shows up very nicely, looks like it has spiral structure but then you have this this large glowing center of old stars more reminiscent of an elliptical. So, you know, there's the, the main separation of galaxies. Okay, you've got spirals do this. They're, they're young, uh, young, hot stars, new star formation going on. You have ellipticals. They're old. They're considered red and dead. They're formed from collisions between large galaxies. But there's a whole slew of stuff out there that's like mid-collision or, you know, what the heck's going on with the sombrero here? What's going on yeah. with M104? So. And, and I know uh, Scott here has got the the view from Stellarium, you can really see it's a very unusual looking galaxy. It's it's almost unique. I've never seen a galaxy that looks like the Sombrero. The Hubble picture of it is just amazing because that, that dust lane that dust lane, that stripe that we see across the middle of this edge on on galaxy, um, which I mean we've got nicely, very nicely here, um, from from Roy. But what Hubble does with this, it's, you can see all this modeling. You can see all these little pockets in it that look like, well, that could be star formation happening, um, as well as the the glow from the the center. I mean, here it, you can see kind of the the middle of the the hat, right? But it fills so much more of the the central region if you if you look at the view from Hubble. Yeah, so. yeah, there you go. Oh, it's one of my favorite images. Yeah, it really is something, yeah. isn't it? it? It's like. It's it like instead of having these like spiral arms, it's like it looks like a blast wave is is coming out, right. and this material is like piling up. It's it's, it's like a, George Lucas is responsible for this yeah, galaxy. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is the George Lucas. Yeah, exactly. The galaxy could go galaxy. supernova. This is what we're seeing. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I'm gonna have to make the grumpy cat face for the idea of a galaxy going supernova. Of course. That's the whole point. It's not. Feasible. <laughs> no. It's not even possible. Not even possible for a whole galaxy to go supernova. Nope. Now, Stuart, you've got an image that you've put up here, and and again, this is not live, no, but not it's live. a. It is a beautiful picture and a wonderful well, example of we were the. Talking, yeah, we were talking about colors, so I like this one because it has different colors of stars in them. This is the double cluster I took last November and uh, recently uh, reprocessed yesterday or the day before. And you can see some yellow and some blue and maybe a little bit of green. And, oh, that's um, so nice. And so yeah. uh, it just it just shows how you can pick up color differences. But again, this is very heavily stretched and saturated in order to bring them out. But, I, I mean, you can really see those cool, the orange stars and the right. whiter stars and the bluer stars. I mean, I really like, I mean, that's when you guys were able to start getting these color CCD images in, that's when the star clusters really started to pop because you can just see oh, these yeah. different colored stars and get this texture mm -hmm. in the galaxies. I really like it. Mm -hmm. uh, Sluggy's asking who missed the introductions, who's on duty tonight. So just to let you know, we've got Gary Ganella and Roy Salisbury, uh, who are broadcasting with their telescopes tonight, and then we've got Stuart Foreman, who has no telescope, but has brought some pictures that he has taken. And I know Thad is going to show us his image of Saturn at some point. Yeah. I guess, last so. well, I guess, so. I guess so. should, should I grab Should I grab that now? I mean, it's, I'm, still, well, I'm still gimping it, trying to get it to are look you? halfway distant. Why? Why? No, no. Just... Raw, just as it was taken. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> Does, Does Gary have the here. Eskimo up there? Is that what this is? Yeah, so I'm going to Gary's view now. Yeah. Now I'm I'm amazed Gary's getting this because it's so tiny. You know. Yeah, I'm zoomed in quite a bit. Yeah. See, there's yeah. my full zoom out. This is this is the owl, isn't it? Yes. Oh, yeah. the owl, right? And so the owl, and there's a, a galaxy up here in the left-hand corner yes. too. I, so, I'm seeing it as the gray alien. Yeah. So M M ninety. M97 is the owl. M108 is the galaxy. I keep wanting the galaxy to be referred to as the Pussycat Galaxy. So we have the Owl Nebula and the Pussycat Galaxy. That would work. And they're, they're, you know, sailing off in the boat together. 
Well, they're sailing off the big dipper. Really cute. I know. Well, I'm going to every time we see the owl and we see M108 up in the corner, I'm going to push for this. Um, so, uh, yeah, just let's let's get some children's literature back in the sky, and they're they're in um, they're in the big dipper. So that's, you can kind of sail off in the big dipper, right? You get in there, you get in the bowl, and you just go floating yeah. through space in it, I guess. Absolutely. Right, Dad. You and I can go write that that book together. Yeah. Well, and then, and then I can just imagine us standing up in front of the IAU and and presenting this. <laughs> yeah. This suggestion. I don't know. Jeez, they're I mean being hard enough about naming exoplanets. Yeah. Try and rename yeah. a galaxy after some. Is it Edward Lear, who wrote the, uh, the children's story, The Owl and the Pussycat? I don't so, know. But yeah. So, but here's the Owl Nebula. In reverse, it. with glowing it's eyes. A bit of a negative, right? And uh, the galaxy up in the upper left corner. So. Uh, whoa. Okay. So Roy brought the galaxies. What? Roy. The gauntlet has been thrown. I'm counting. Look at this camera. Oh yeah. Right. There's Mark One, Mark. two, oh, three, there's four, Mark five, chain. five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Roy, did you <laughs> use the coordinates I gave you, or did, you, did you find um, I just, I just basically centered it on M84 and took an image. So I'm seeing about 18, yeah. 19 galaxies here, but maybe I'm... Are those two bright objects galaxies as well? Yep. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, the two the two bright objects, um, top center, and then just a little bit to the right of that. The top center one is M86. The one just a little bit to the right is M84. Um, you have a disturbed, peculiar galaxy off to the left that's kind of being tidally influenced. You've got a bunch of spirals, a bunch of other ellipticals. The deeper you dive into this image, just the more you will see the Virgo cluster is quite rich, and this is um, the part of it that kind of puts on the most spectacular display. So, Honestly, good shot. The field of view was not wide enough to get everything. Yeah, I mean <laughs> M87. Sorry, um, I mean M87 is going to be below and a little bit to the left of this edge of the field of view, and so that is the largest galaxy in the Virgo cluster. These are just other large elliptical galaxies at the the top center and a little bit to the right of that. Um, but again, we're, we're talking hundreds of galaxies, hundreds of full-size galaxies in the Virgo cluster, and this is uh, kind of the, I would say, the most aesthetically pleasing part of it. I mean, right. A, yeah. right. Chet, Chet uh, 1138 is saying that I, I called this the meh galaxy cluster. Mm -hmm. but No, that was oh, 8182. That was 8182, yeah. Yeah, 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 it was wait, different. Wait, 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 it was M64, or sorry, M65, M66. Was it? MGC3628, it's the Leo triplet. Mm, yeah, yeah. That's right. Virals, and then the edge on that's the right. hamburger yeah. galaxy. Mm, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm, meh. Mm, meh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, this one's a little more, I'm trying to think as I anthropomorphize it. Huh. See, and that's what I'm thinking. Maybe we should put out to our, our, our fans out yeah. there to turn this into a constellation of galaxies. What does yeah. this show out to you? What, does, what do you see? Huh. Right. Hmm. Be interesting to... to Russell, Russell like Bateman that. counts 20 oh. in this image, and that's good, surprising he's seeing this through the, the sort of yes. the rendered version on YouTube, so yeah. I'm, I'm impressed. I'll, I'll post, it. I'll post the, the full resolution one. Yeah, that'd be great, Roy. So How long is your it. exposure on this one, Roy? That's a five minute. Hmm. Yeah, I count fourteen just sitting here. So just <laughs> yeah. real quick. So, uh, Chad eleven thirty eight is asking Thad, what mount to use with your nine point two five, and are you happy with it? I've got a C Jam mount for it. Um, interesting story. The first one I got was busted out of the box. <laughs> Um, that doesn't happen very often, but for fortunately, the the camera shop that I got it through, the camera and telescope shop, replaced it immediately. Um, which was which was very good because I would have been very unhappy to have spent that much money on something that just didn't work. Um, but uh, yeah, but I, I've been quite happy with it. I mean, it's it takes takes some learning, you know, learning to balance it properly. I mean, astrophotography has a steep learning curve, and it's good to get on forums and and get to asking other people about uh, kind of tricks and and uh, techniques that they use to make it more enjoyable rather than just frustrating. Uh, yeah. But this this mount has worked really, really well for me. Had it out again last night and was, you know, imaging Saturn and then just showing people who stopped by on the sidewalk you know, um, Saturn before the clouds ate it up. Speaking so. of, of Saturn, Roy, is there any chance that you could get an image of Saturn? <laughs> I 
It's like, no. No, no, Roy, the no. silent treatment. It'll, Roy. It'll, it'll, it'll be a little low for Roy, and I think still it's... Will it? Yeah. It's still pretty low in the sky for... I mean, I can get into Solarium if you really want. Yeah. But it's not going to be the same. But I can track it like a champ. Yeah. <laughs> Even, well, just sort of see what his what his view is. I'm not sure what is how far down to the horizon he's got, but um, I'm gonna move to to Gary's view. This is IC four four. No, excuse me, IC four hundred five called the Flaming Star Nebula, and that's a one minute exposure. I think we've done this one before, right? I think yeah. so too. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about Saturn, there's there's one from last night, but again, seeing was bad. Elevation was low. Somebody in Hollywood was doing one of those floodlight things through the sky. <laughs> Clouds were moving in. That's got to be hard hard on your view. A little and, bit. Were you carrying your mount uphills both ways while taking this as well? I'm not Steward. No? Yeah. <laughs> in your little wagon. <laughs> no, that looks great. I mean, you can see the bands. You can see the bands in the in the rings. You can see the bands on the planet. It looks fantastic. Yeah. You even get a little bit. You can and you get an idea of there's a dark spot at the, the one pole, so you get a hint that well, there's some feature there. If you look at like Christopher Goh or Damien Peach or any of these other guys who, who do the really amazing planetary shots, you can see it actually is a hexagon. Mike, you know, Mike Phillips, a um, couple of the other kind of uh, regulars that we see in the, the space community who post their own pictures, um, they've actually been able to resolve the hexagon at the pole. So me, i got to wait a little bit. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go back to Gary to Gary's view here. So it was IC405, the Flaming Star Nebula, mm -hmm. and and what is it? It is a hydrogen emission nebula. There is um, a variable star in it, and so the amount of light that you get for the rest of the nebula will change oh, a little bit over time. So. Um, yeah, so it's uh, the, the the whole idea of uh, flaming flaming star. Um, actually, wait, am I thinking? I might be thinking Heinz Variable Nebula. Anyway, but sorry about that. Um, but again, another hydrogen uh, region region of uh, hot hydrogen gas. The electrons uh, have been ionized out of the hydrogen as they come back in. They drop in level. They give off this characteristic red light. For example, the type that Stewart is showing in his photo of the reset here. Um, and Gary's setup is particularly attuned uh, to pick up this particular type of light. So, if I remember correctly, what the uh, flaming star is in Orica? Yeah. Okay. And it does have a variable star in it. I've just confirmed for you. Okay. Cool. So you know that right. thing that you just pulled off the top of your head? That is true. Okay. <laughs> You're still smart, Dad. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. We yes. we have just confirmed. Yeah. So here's a, here's another view of it. Me, yeah. thank um. you. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody's asking. I guess Jim Cox is asking with a prevailing theory about the hexagon on Saturn, and these. You know, typically, if you look at fluid flow, you you expect circles, maybe ellipses or ovals, like if you look in Jupiter's atmosphere you see the great red spot and the red spot junior also known as oval BA so so why do we end up with a hexagon? Um, it's been shown that if you can have fluids moving at um, certain speeds with respect to each other and you end up with a kind of a um, small integer number ratios in the speeds in the intersection and the outer section, you can actually develop um, polygon figures in there. And so the way that you tune the rotation of the speed of the inner fluid and the rotation of the speed of the outer fluid, you can um, get side, you know, figures of different numbers of sides. On Saturn, it just happens to work out that that ratio produces a hexagon. They've, so. Have you ever been to like a yeah science center and there's like this big spinny disc and you spin the disc really fast and and you get this turbulence and you get these 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 shapes like that. In many cases, they're you know they're more like they're like almost like twenty sided shapes and things like that, depending on how fast you're spinning them and what the consistency of the of the liquids are as they're rubbing against each other. Yeah, it's pretty cool. 
So, I mean, typically what you get there again are, are eddies and swirls and places where turbulence causes these neat wavy, you know, patterns behind. Yeah. The eddies, dynamics but, for the so, win. Yay! Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it takes some very, you know, precise kind of tuning to develop these things. That's why everybody was kind of baffled by the hexagon and why right. people, you know, come up with questions like, wait, what's the prevailing theory about it? Um, and it, it's amazing that you know the Saturn system that the the speeds from in, close to the pole to just a few um, degrees of latitude, you know, about 10, 15 degrees latitude away from the pole, that the the ratio of the speeds is correct to develop a hexagon, which took even you know longer to playing around with fluid dynamics in the lab to present the same um, the same figure. So. Um. Well, we got oh, we got a new image from Roy, and then we'll go back to the one that uh, that Gary's doing. So, Roy, I don't know if you caught that. Any chance of you getting Saturn, a picture of Saturn tonight? I I just tried. It's too low, too bright, and too small. Huh, Unfortunately, right. I have the same problem. Yeah. I complain about it. Yeah, I my toes got too big. It's just a blob. <laughs> so, if it, I mean, if it's too bright, I mean, you just like, would you not be able to ever get it with this setup? No, I yeah, I can't get it with this setup. You need a, a an actual webcam that can get you know twenty frames a second type of thing, and I can't go that low. Right, it would just yeah. be completely overexposed. Yeah, and that is what I was shooting last night. It was twenty frames a second. Whoa! Yeah. You win the prize. So <laughs> I, was, I tried so. a fifth. I tried basically one twentieth of a second or one fifth of a second. It was just overblown. Still, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other um, thing is with fast optics like that. I mean, optics where the the focal length is is um, not many times bigger. You know, less than four or five times bigger than the the aperture of your telescope. You're going to get flooded with light. If you're trying to shoot planets, you want a nice large, much longer focal length. Like I guess Stewart typically shoots at what f seven. Yes, f seven uh, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, so he gives us these great views of planetary nebula um, and the, these objects where it's better for getting a more zoomed in uh, view and where the surface brightness is higher. You, you want to be able to pick that apart more um, and not just get flooded with light and your sensors immediately kind of pinned at the high level. So, so going with slightly slower optics, larger focal lengths are, are better for that kind of thing. If we want to do galaxies and nebulae and star clusters, then the setups that Gary and Roy have are perfect for those. And speaking of a star cluster here, Roy's got a some kind of like big ball of stars here. Yes, that is M3, and actually, this this five minute image was too much. It blew out blew out the center. I can't really focus in on those. I mean, you can't really bring up the center of it because there's just the exposure was too long. My God, it's full of stars. It's so <laughs> but M3, I don't think we've seen M3 very often. No, M M three is a globular cluster in. Um, I forget if it's in Canis Venatici or um, or Coma Berenices. It's up there by the North Galactic Pole. Um, again, one of these many objects that Harlow Shapley used to figure out: Hey, the sun's not in the center of the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is much bigger than we thought by looking at the distribution of these globular clusters. That they're centered in Sagittarius. So if you if you're trying to plot, you know, where are all the globular clusters in the sky, um, the average ends up being in Sagittarius, and that's where, if you were looking out through the the night sky from here on Earth, that's the direction to look for the center of the galaxy, is Sagittarius. So this is up north. This is above the galactic plane. Um, yeah, and quite a few uh, globular clusters up in that region too. There's also what M53 and it's I believe 5054 are right next to each other. Something where, if one of you guys want to try for it, you've got a big enough field of view, you should be able to get two globulars, two pretty good globulars in the same field of view. I Let's believe get it's a M53. Guys. Nice. Which one? That would be a first. M53, and then if you put that in one corner, I can't remember exactly which corner, um, mm -hmm. you should be also able to get a second globular in the same field of view. Okay. Can always try. All right, that just that just sounded like he took it as a challenge. <laughs> this, yeah, this is where we're just pushing the limits now. Right? Yeah. You know, well, let's find something. Let's make it hard. Make it hard. Yeah, let's, let's make it two, hard two in one view. Yeah. All right. Scott and Fraser I'm gonna move over to, tonight. I know, I'm gonna move over to Gary's view, and I think I see the Crab Nebula. You do, and uh, we're about to lose it over the horizon too. I was oh, bouncing right. around, seeing if I could pull out Rosette. 
Orion, nothing. Those are gone for the season. Yeah, they're now. gone. And this one's real low on the horizon. But uh, I figured I'd pop it off there because next week we won't have it. Yeah. And all the pe- people who are like asking us now, they, now it's the can we see the Orion Nebula? That is now going to begin. Yep. <laughs> right. For the next six months, it's going to be can we see the Orion no. Nebula. Yeah. And if you go to Stellarium, no. you can. Yeah. Yeah. If you can look and- through the look through the ground. And then they forget when it's winter. Do they always ask for the dumbbell? Is that or the in, ring? In winter, so. yeah, they want to see the ring nebula. They want to see the eagle nebula. Right. Oh, the right. eagle. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. They want to see the pillars of creation. Yeah. It's like, come back in six months. Come back in six months. <laughs> so, yeah. Or go back in time six months. But. Oh, is that your photo of it, Stuart? Yes. Oh, is, that's I just, great. I was just going to show a difference just so, you know, his is live, mine's processed, and this is more or less what the color it, uh, it looks like. Um, cause there's a lot of noise in it that I, I'm going to have to reprocess this at some point, but um, you can oh, at least still. see the color in it. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Pretty nice. Love that structure. And it's also great because it's such a recent object. I mean, it's only been around for a thousand years. Visible to us only about a thousand. No, it's it's about seventy five hundred light years away. Uh, I'm sorry, about sixty five hundred light years away. So the supernova did, did blow up seventy five hundred years ago. It's just because it's so far away that light first reached us in ten fifty four, and yeah. so we're seeing this after a thousand years of development. But if you were closer to it, it would be expanded over an even larger region of the sky. I mean, who knows which filaments have run into which other bits of gas, or maybe it's even more dispersed and looks something more like the Veil Nebula or IC433 that we looked at before. And any time you're looking around the sky, you know, you, you take a picture of one object. This shows what it is in, in the particular state that we see it, but you can always find another similar object that's more evolved, sometimes another similar object that's less evolved. Um, or earlier on its development, later on its development, you really have to sample the whole sky, as many nebulae as you can, as many star clusters as you can, as many galaxies as you can, to put the whole picture together. Because the time frame for astronomy, yeah, this okay, this thing blew up, it brightened, it was it was visible during the daytime for a month as a supernova. It was an extra bright star for two years. That is an incredibly quick less than a blink of an eye for most astronomical phenomena. Most of these these developments take millions of years, tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. So all you right. can really get at any one point is a, a snapshot. Um, well, the human timeline's so short, and we're just a bunch of fragile little meat sacks that aren't <laughs> able to really comprehend what these things are doing. And so being able to see those processes over time is great. Right. Uh, Chet uh, 1130 is noting that clusters always remind me of the Buck Rogers closing credits. You know, you remember like watching Buck Rogers way back, you know, yeah. yeah, with those like stars that are going past. And I actually read or saw some interview at one point where they explained how they did that. And it was ping pong balls. They just set a camera on the ground. <laughs> they just dumped tons and tons of ping pong balls and they had it really dark, but then they had the ping balls lit with this really bright white light, so they've got really oversaturated, and the balls just fell past. And then I think they showed like a blooper version of the ping pongs actually bouncing off the camera at some point. That's but awesome. That's how they actually did that scene, yeah. Um, Alan Eggleston asks, will Betelgeuse produce a nebula like the Crab Nebula, and how big do you think it would look from our distance away? Oh, that's a really good question. Will it be a supernova remnant in the style or or the genre of the Crab Nebula? Yes. What exactly will it look like? That's a good it question will, because it depends. It will look on, exactly awesome. Well, that's what it will look. yeah. That's ex- how exactly it will look. It always depends on how stuff is puffed off of the star before it goes supernova, and so the distribution of stuff around there as you get these inner regions blasting out at about 10% of the speed of light, they hit the stuff that has been puffed off slower ahead of time. So when you're looking at the, the Crab Nebula here, right, you're, you're seeing all these tangles, all these filaments. It's the interaction between the stuff that came off before the star blew up and then the incredible shock waves and um, higher density mat- material getting lit up brightly as this energy passes through it that gives it this kind of, you know, weird veiny look to it. What will the one around Betelgeist look like? 
Um, aside from awesome, we don't know. I mean, if you look at, for instance, the development of 1987A, the supernova in the Large Magellanic Cloud. I mean, right now, if you if you looked right after the supernova happened, okay, you can't really see much of anything. But now we see that there's these two ring structures. There are other ring structures on the interior. So again, it depends on what happened before it blew up, and then once it blows up, how how does the uh, the energy flying out from the middle hit the stuff that was ejected before? Yeah, uh, but you also look at much older ones like the was it the, the veil and the crescent nebula yeah. and, and those are I, seeing it several thousand years more in the future where it's drifted apart a lot more and the it's all starting to get less and less illuminated and starting to disappear. Well, the crescent's going to be interesting. Um for whoever, whichever generation of humans, if we still exist, whoever gets to see that, that's that's a wolf ray star, and it's puffed out its outer layers already, but the star is not yet gone supernova. And so when it does, there's all this stuff that's around it, and then that's already out a few light years away from the star itself. So as the star blows up, and this energy starts to light this stuff up all over again, um, that, that one's going to be... Yeah, that one's already impressive, just going to be even more impressive once the, the Wolf Ray at the middle goes supernova. Yeah. Uh, well, so we got, I'm going to sort of show off these last two images, and then I think we're, it's time to start wrapping it up. So, so Gary, uh, you put up a galaxy and another uh, galaxy. Two of them, M81 and M82. So nearby, these guys are, you know, if we looked at M101 being in our neighborhood a couple blocks over, these are one or two blocks closer than M101. This is about 12 million light years away for this pair. Uh, kind of a grand design spiral for M81, the one that's more central, and that's gravitationally tidally interacting with M82, the one on the left. So a typical spiral galaxy maybe forms one star a year. No, it doesn't sound like a lot, but over a million years, that's a million new stars. The one on the right in this picture, M82, because of the gravitational disturbance from M81, is forming stars at about 100 stars a year. It's called a starburst galaxy, and the amount of energy coming out is actually causing some of the gas, the hydrogen, to spray out of the galaxy. You often see this in kind of color-enhanced, longer, um, longer exposure images. You get a little taste of it here. It looks like there's a little jet coming out yeah, to yeah. the one side. Mm -hmm. it's um, gorgeous red in this area. Yeah. But again, the star formation rate in that is just so incredibly intense that it it has it's pushing the, the raw material for making new stars out of it. So in a way, the, the wicked amount of star formation it has is killing off the ability to make new stars in this galaxy. All right, and the last image, uh, Roy Salisbury's uh, galaxy. Another galaxy. It is the Galaxy Night. Oh, yeah, M63. All right, this is the Black Eye Galaxy. The Black Eye Galaxy, right. So, again, it's not like it's gotten punched or anything. Um, but you have this this pretty dark, thick dust lane, and it's asymmetric. And so, you know, how to get there? You know, that's worth investigating. I mean, I'm sure somebody's um, PhD has probably addressed this to some degree. As we look at it more with infrared, look at it more in, in these other wavelengths, we get a, a better idea of its its evolution or so. Um, you know, spiral galaxy. It has all this this extra gas and dust. And I'm trying to remember when there was. There's been a supernova in this one. At least but in the last but I mean, 50. it's probably some kind of galactic harassment would would give it that kind of a structure. Um, possibly a merger. So Not, I wouldn't yeah. say so much as a harassment gave it a black eye. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> it has to have a restraining order put against the other galaxy. <laughs> yeah, they pay um, lunch money. But yeah. but more more likely a merger. More likely where two galaxies collided and, and all of the extra dust. Now not full size galaxies. Full size galaxies would completely disrupt the spiral structure. So maybe it had a snack of like a dwarf galaxy and now there's this extra gas and dust on the, the one side of it. So so I don't know if people have have seen what uh, what Scott did last night. Oh, oh sorry, last uh, last week with the Star Party. So Scott did a a shortened version of the Star Party. Did the Star Party no. in sixty seconds? Oh, no. and it was <clears throat> it was awesome. I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, it, we, your your students won't get anything out of that. They they'll have okay, no good. way to All right. yeah, All right. yeah, no. yeah we have no yeah. use to them. Okay, it, it was it's a quick and dirty. <laughs> this is what we did. Go watch the real show. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. I was worried about that. <laughs> um, but it was—it's was good because it just showed like a highlight of all of the objects that we looked at, and it really gives. Um, uh, just if people want to know like what the star party looks like and what we see, and 
wh how what the pace is. It's a way to sort of see it really quickly. So I thought it was really so, cool. And this this goes yeah, out for to the Cerrito students. Uh, if you send me five dollars each week, <laughs> I can give you some show notes. And, right. Uh, <laughs> Except for at the <laughs> end, Scott, you said you were the you. It was not the Sombrero Galaxy. That was the whale, the humpback whale galaxy. The whale galaxy. Right. Mm. And we started making whale noises. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, cool. Well, I think we can start to wrap it up. Oh, uh, BTL743. Yes, we recognize your name. You're one of the superstars. Um, uh, wants to know if we can see see the tarantula, and we can't see the tarantula because we don't have a, an astronomer in the southern hemisphere who can give us the night view. We need somebody in Africa or South America. Australia right? or South America. Well, I guess Australia New Zealand. Australia States. won't work. It's going to have to be right. a South America. Yeah, South America so, probably. Tanya Carruthers maybe? Yeah. Well, she's in South Africa. But she's right. in South Africa, yeah. Yeah. And so, so we need some, uh, some people from Chile. Anybody? Yeah. So, Anybody? Argentina. Anybody, Argentina, uh, Chile, Peru. Brazil. Yeah, that'd be great. South of the middle. Um, yeah. Before we close yeah. it up here, Thad, how, uh, how up are you on relativity? I could answer a question or two relatively well. Okay, one of the things on what I have read is said, Einstein said, if light cannot travel between two events, you can't say one event happened before the other. Oh, the whole simultaneity problem. Um, it, I mean, yeah. it's just, it, it, they exist in totally different light cones. I mean, if you if you look at what one event, you, you we do a graph where we put, um, say, time on this axis, and mm -hmm. we put space on this axis. So an event happens, and then anything that falls in inside this cone could potentially influence something else. Well, if something else has its own cone over here and there's no overlap between the two, um, I don't know, can you really... You could have a third observer... You're making look bad for the student, Gary. I got this, I got this. You could have a third observer in the middle who could be able to determine light from one event, light from the other event, and as long as you can measure distances, you can make a determination of which one happened first. It's okay, just that so they can't influence each other. What I'm leading to is, can we really say something 7,000 years ago or 7,000 light years ago, really happened 7,000 years if the light's just now reaching us. Yes. I, um, I understand the math. I understand how it works, but there's a confusion I've always had in there. How can they not be simultaneous? So, um, I mean, the, the problem here is just the, the amount of time it takes light to get to us. If, if the sun had a solar flare right now, we would have no possible information about that until the light from it reached some telescope that was observing it. So let's say it's the SOHO satellite that's about a tenth of an, a, thousand, a hundredth of an AU toward the sun. It would get that information, well, about eight, a little under, about eight minutes later. So did it actually happen eight minutes ago? Yes. Um, but again, that information wouldn't be available until some signal arrived. The signal taking the speed of light would, would take that light long to arrive. So. It, it, it's one I played around with a lot because if you can't go to see it, you can't truly say it happened eight minutes ago. We can logically say that, and I understand that. Yeah, yeah. So but there's no so way to prove it. From an epistemological kind of kind of viewpoint. So I mean there's some some real interesting things out there. Like for instance the supernova has been detected um, near the, the pillars or the shock wave from a supernova has been detected in the region of the pillars of creation. So even though we look at the Eagle Nebula, we see the pillars of creation, we know that that shock wave that is approaching them should have destroyed them, so they're actually already gone. But because the Eagle Nebula is far enough away, we haven't. We still see the pillars of creation as existing, mm -hmm. even though in in reality, because we we can see the shock wave, it's approaching them. Well, it's far enough away that in the rest frame of the nebula itself, that shock wave has already hit. But it's far enough away that we haven't seen that event tra transpire yet. Okay. It, 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 oh. We're getting deep yeah. and philosophical yeah. in the BSP. Very philosophical. You, you asked about so relativity. Frank, things are going to get weird. Yeah, oh, right we as we're wrapping two... things up, Gary, you asked right. about relativity. Yeah. We got the two globulars. Well, <laughs> Fraser, or he, Gary extended the time so I yep. could get this downloaded. So he's he able to make it happen. Oh, it's a conspiracy. Yes. I see how it was. Wait, Wait a minute. Gary, Gary, you're you're working together. Together. Yeah. Please explain string theory to me real quick. Second challenge for the night made it in. M53. 
And I think it's fifty fifty four or fifty fifty three. I can't remember. I just can't remember. So, <laughs> but but it is also a globular cluster. Yes, that's an open cluster, isn't it? Oh, it's an open cluster. Okay. No, they're they're both globulars. It's just one they're is a lot richer. Globulars? Yeah, they're both globulars. One is just a lot richer than the other. Ah. So if you the density of stars in the middle, you know, we we could really try up in the exposure, and then M fifty three would be overblown, and then we yeah. could actually pick out more of the the globular structure in that's uh, cool. NGC fifty whatever it is. Um, so awesome. yeah, yep. Cool. Well, nice now job. I'm going to officially wrap it up. Nicely done, guys. So, yes. Gary Ganella, thank you very much for bringing the uh, the view from LA. And Roy, again, I really like this setup. I am, you know, I'm really, really happy with the way these have been turning out. Like last week, you really had it, and this week, it's even better. So, so keep this up. This is great, man. Cool. And uh, Stuart. Thanks, or you weren't able to get some telescope happening, but uh, it was great to have you join us and show off some of those pictures, so I really appreciate that. Scott, always great to have your help. Absolutely. And Thad, thank you very much for bringing the, uh, bringing the science. All right. All thanks right, well, thanks, thanks everybody. I think the next thing we're going to be doing is uh, we'll be doing Astronomy Cast tomorrow. I believe we're going to be wrapping up our uh, trilogy on space stations. So we're going to be talking about the International Space Station and the new Chinese Tiangong Station. So uh, that's going to be tomorrow on Astronomy Cast. That's at noon Pacific, uh, 3 Eastern, 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, et cetera. So. Right. And I think there's Learning Space on Wednesday, Planetary Society on Thursday, Weekly Space Hangout on Friday. Yep. And then Sunday I'll be doing uh, another show with Science Sunday. We're doing a panel on ferret flu, H5N1, and then the virtual star party again next week. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you all next time.